Well, on behalf of the uh, Academy and the Committee on uh, Fellowship and the Certificates, uh, welcome to this webinar. And I'm assuming you're all here because you're interested in how to go about obtaining this, uh, this uh, certificate. So let's get started. Okay, what's today's agenda? First of all, we have to ask ourselves, why do we want to obtain the certificate? How do we get started? What are the requirements? What is the application process? And what, at the end, I'm going to show you an example of a very successful, very well executed application. Okay, so why do we obtain the certificate? You can see, first of all, it looks very nice, doesn't it? It would be very, very handsome on your wall. But let's say what it really does is it gives you an opportunity to demonstrate your knowledge and achievement in implant dentistry. To quote Paul Bynum, prosthodontist in California, who was one of the first to receive the certificate, I'm going to read exactly his quote. I'm so proud, proud that the AO is offering a credible means of acknowledging proficiency in implant dentistry. The main reason I decided to obtain the certificate was to make a statement. Our patients and public need means of distinguishing fact from fancy. The hype is out there. I do implants, you do implants, we all do implants, it's not enough. I believe that obtaining the certificate is a very good start. First of all, it tells the public, you know your stuff, you have been vetted by your professionals, and it gives you credibility. As you know, unfortunately, the way uh, medicine and dentistry is going today, a lot of it has become, become a commodity, and you find people that are shopping around. They can go to a guy down the street, well, this fellow charges this. How much do you charge? And you can have an intelligent discussion with them it's about what are their credentials. It gives you credibility among your peers and your patients. So it does showcase your achievements among your peers. You see, you're making a statement. This is the standard of dentistry that I have obtained. They give patients a degree of confidence. And it's an excellent tool for marketing your practice. And from a personal standpoint, I just do pros. I do not place implants. And approximately one-third of my patients are referred to me by specialists, either periodontists or oral surgeons. So it actually gives you a leg up with your referral base if you're a restorative dentist. As you can see, this is uh, the opening page on my website, and you can see right there where the red hour is, AO Certificate in Implant Dentistry. So you can put that right on your website. Okay, so let's talk, talk about beginning the process. First of all, you have to get organized. Now, what that means is you have to start documenting your cases. Unfortunately, there are most of us out there do not document your cases. You have to invest in a good camera with proper lenses and a flash made for intro photography. It w it's not difficult to do, but there are many courses out there. You can go on YouTube and learn how to take intro pictures. It's not difficult. And whether you're a Mac user or a PC user, there are programs out there to help you organize your photographs. But most importantly, you have to get a decent camera. And I, what I call Frankenstein cameras, you know, where you have a, a body and you go buy your own lens and your flash. I really don't recommend that. There are companies out there that sell complete packages. Photomed, Washington Scientific, Lester Dine, to name a few. Uh, in fact, Photomed is a supporter of the AO. They always have a, a, a nice booth, you know, at every meeting. And uh, they all have packages, complete packages, where they have the, the mirrors, the contrasters, the lenses are set up. They make it basically very easy. I mean, you don't have to worry about taking photographs like you, you're trying to get them published in a quintessence publication. That's not what we're looking for. Just decent photographs. But you have to start taking photographs of every one of your cases so you can build up a library so when it comes time to put together the application, 
you have your photographs, every single one. To give you an idea, I started documenting every case that I've done from uh, a single tooth to a full reconstruction starting in the early 90s. So when it came time for me to obtain the certificate, I had a whole library out there. So this is where it all begins. You have to start documenting your cases. Okay, so what are the requirements? Obviously, you have to be a dentist or in active practice or in academics. You have to be a member of the academy for three consecutive years and have it in, that, in that time have attained at least two of the annual meetings. You have to submit your cases according to the case presentation template. I'll show you about that, and you can get that online off our website. Okay, so what are the requirements? You have to do a single tooth. You have to do a fixed partial denture. You have to do a full arch reconstruction, and you have to do an overdenture. In addition, one of the cases must fulfill the requirements of immediate temporization and immediate loading. And you can apply to the certificate in either one of three categories. If you're just a restorative dentist or prosthodontist, you can get a certificate just in that. If you just do the surgery, you can get a certificate for that. Or if you do both, you can get a certificate for that. Okay. However, when the cases are submitted, each case must be signed and notarized for authenticity by the patient. Okay. What are the continuing education requirements and core requirements? Now, I'm, this is what they are today. I'm not saying these education requirements are going to be are, are going to be the same next year or the year after that. This is a, rel a relatively new process of getting the certificate, and we on the committee are still working out the little kinks. And this is brand new. Uh, when the when uh, when the when the uh, certificate was first offered, there were no waiving of any CE requirements. Now we are waiving some of the requirements, but this may change. Okay, so let's review that. Over a five-year period, you have to have 200 hours of continuing education in implant-related subjects in 18 specific categories, okay? 85 of those credits must be considered in core knowledge, which I'll show you later on in this presentation. A list of the various categories can be obtained from the AO website. You must be able to verify through certificates, you know, CE certificates that you get that you did take these courses, and this can all be sent to the academy through the Dropbox account. Okay. There are, as of now, like I said, there are exemptions. This may change, but this is the way it is right now. If you have a certificate in a monospecialty or a GPR or an AEGD, that's older than five years, 85 hours of the core knowledge credits will be waived. If it is less than five years, all 200 hours at this time of CE credits and core knowledge will be waived. Like I said, this may be subject to change, but as of now, this is the way it is. Okay. However, the AO wants to make the process easy. We do not want to make this difficult. And there's ways that we're going about doing that. Okay. When you attend an annual meeting, the uh, program guide lists courses, and there are going to be numbers next to each of that course that requires, that, excuse me, that indicates in what category the CE credits from that course will be credited towards the core or general knowledge in implant dentistry. Okay, so here's an example. Surgical complications in emergency medicine. As you can see, there's a number four there. And as you can see, here are the 18 required categories. And you can see number four corresponds to emergency medicine. Now you'll also notice that there are asterisks 
next to some of those some of the categories. That indicates the categories that are con- that are considered core or basic knowledge. As you can see, that we have uh, radiographic interpretation, diagnosis and treatment planning, uh, radiographic and surgical guide, surgical implant placement, uh, restorative implant procedures. Those are the core knowledge. And just because you don't, let's say, necessarily do surgery, you should have taken courses in surgery to know what's going on, and it makes you better able to communicate with your surgical partners. And vice versa, if you just are a periodontist and oral surgeon, you should have some knowledge in the restorative procedures that restorative dentists are trying to do and accomplish. Okay, so here you can see... uh, Two courses from the last meeting by Mauricio and William. You can see Mauricio's course corresponds to number nine, which is surgical placement. And Bill's course is on implant biomaterials. Here's Steve's course, which corresponds to number six, which is diagnosis and treatment planning. And Terry Walton from Australia, he can be in three different categories. Uh, risk, biomaterials, treatment planning. So you can see how the, how, the, uh, how the literature and the, and, the, and the publication for the meeting, you can figure out what courses correspond to what you can take according to what you, you're deficient in and what you need. Okay, so let's look at the template. Okay, it's, it's, it's very self-explanatory. You have the case title, the clinician's names. Let's say if you're a restorative doctor, you put your name there. And you, underneath were team members, any specialist that you use could be an orthodontist, periodontist, oral surgeon, endodontist, any other doctor that was involved in treatment with that case. Then you have to summarize the case. You have to give a background. In the case presentation, uh, you go, and according to what you do, you're going to have to back that up with the lit- in the literature. I'll, 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 we'll go over that in a minute. Uh, what the outcome and follow-up was, a discussion, and then we have to have three to five take-home learning points. To give you an idea, uh, we're only going to, as on the committee, we're only going to accept peer-reviewed research articles from high quality journals. For example, the IJOMI, Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry, Clinical Implant Dentistry and Related Research, Journal of Perio. You can see the list there. The Cochrane Review. We're not looking for any of the trade journals that we get. Nothing wrong with them like Insight Dentistry, things like that. Dental Town. They're not high quality peer reviewed journals, research journals. This is what we're looking for. Now if you're not familiar on how to access these articles, I'll, I'll clue you in. It's very, very easy. There are many search tools that we have. One good one is called Google Scholar. All you have to do is, let's say you, uh, you're you writing up your article and you want to know what's the literature on, say, on uh, immediate loading. All you have to do is type in keywords like immediate loading dental implants, and a whole list of articles will come out. You can actually set the range, what years you want it, uh, unfortunately, if you don't have access to a university library or you don't subscribe to any one particular journal, you're only going to be able to get access to the, uh, the abstracts. But that's usually good enough. Okay, another good source is PubMed. Medline, Science Direct, Scopus, they're all good research tools to search for your article. So it's not difficult to search the literature. Okay, now... We do require a certain photographic format. Okay, in the pretreatment, we're going to need a frontal view, a clusal view of the maxilla, a clusal view of the mandible, right lateral, and left lateral. And any full facial uh, pictures obviously want to, uh, you know, black out the patient's eyes, privacy purposes. And basically, we're going to need the same type of photographs for the finished case and any follow-ups that may occur. Uh, 
usually it'll say on the on the template that about 20 photographs. But if you go over it a little bit more or a little bit less, we're not going to hold that against you. But they have to be good quality photographs that demonstrate what has been done. Okay. Uh, some notes if there are some notes about the surgical procedures that were performed. Uh, if you're, like I said, if you're restored, if you are a restored uh, dentist, you can get that information from your surgical colleague, and vice versa for the restorative end for the surgeons out there, you can get the descriptions for the restorative procedures from your restorative colleague. Okay, and at the end, this is the uh, statement of authenticity and truth that you're going to have to sign, and uh, basically that's that. Okay, so let's let's see an example uh, of a well-executed uh, application. Okay, we're not going to go through all, all the different categories, but basically we're just basically going to do a uh, a single tooth and a fixed partial denture. So single tooth. Okay, here's the background. Uh, we have a healthy 27-year-old after a hockey injury. Okay, dentist. See how the dentist what he's doing. He has a Good, good photographs with good captions stating exactly what, what's going on. Uh, let me see if I can get rid of this this, this part over here because you can't see this photograph here. But he's showing here in the x-ray on, on the lower right how the tooth is not restorable. But the important thing is the framing of the pictures and the description, the clinical description of what, what's going on. Okay. Here we have the pre-treatment. He's doing his workup. We have the pre-treatment CBCT. Here we have pictures from the surgery. Now, this was this this presentation was done by a prosthodontist here in Philadelphia, and uh, his surgical colleague provided the surgical photographs. So you have to make sure that uh, for the restorative doctors out there. You have to make sure that your surgical colleague is taking adequate photographs. And if you tell them, listen, I want, to, I want to do this for a certificate, I need photographs, you tell them what, what's required, and they should be able to do that for you. Okay, so he, you know, he shows the, uh, the fractured tooth uh, on the upper left and the upper right. Uh, he has his non-restrictive surgical guide, um, the, imp the implant placement. Uh, with uh, some grafting that's done there and uh, a description of the procedures. And on the lower right, you see the case when it's, when it's uh, sutured, sutured, sutured together, okay? Here's a, a CBCT and a, and a periodical x-ray of the implant in place. And he, the doctor described here how initially he did a transitional removal partial denture during the early healing phase. After the initial healing, he describes here how he used a, a peak temporary abutment to contour the, uh, the tissue and help develop the emergence profile. But notice the quality of the pictures and the captions and the descriptions. He's leaving nothing to guesswork and he's describing everything nice and clearly what is being done. Okay, and here he's, he's going to, he's trend, you can see he's transitionalizing into a fixed temporary restoration to further enhance the emergence profile and the gingival contours. Now you can see here, there was a complication. There was a fistula and he described what was going on. It was removed by a laser and it, he and it healed up. It's really nice, you know, it's very nice to show uh, very straightforward cases, but it's even better if you show a case that had a little bit of a complication and show you how you managed it. Okay, uh, shows following the healing phase with the provisional in place. Nice captions and descriptions, like I said. Okay, he's going through the uh, provision of making a uh, a custom impression coping based on the uh, anatomy of his provisional restoration. He shows, has photographs of the 
of the impressions. And if you notice in the upper right, he shows the, how the, uh, the final restoration on the left compares to the uh, provisional that he fabricated on the right. And the case in place. And the final case, as we all can agree, he had a very nice, nice outcome. So that's the first case. And here is his description. He has a, you know, this is all, I'm not going to read everything that he has written down. This is all going to be available. The webinar will be available on the Academy's website. So if you want to go through this and actually see how this particular clinician uh, did his descriptions, his background, and his case presentation, you'll be able to do that. You can see he has a listing of the, uh, of the uh, articles that he, that he quoted his outcome, discussion, and learning points. Once again, you'll be able to access this on the Academy's website if you want to go through step-by-step -step to read how we went about doing this to give you an idea on how you can format your discussion and presentation. Okay, and this is the statement of truth that uh, you have to get uh, notarized by your signature and the patient's signature. Okay, let's do case number two. This is a fixed bridge. Okay. Here's a picture that he describes here, a picture of the patient prior to any implant treatment. Okay, and what happened, the patient uh, had some trauma, he fractured that bridge, and he gives an explanation here, some nice photographs. Okay, and here you can see the trauma. Okay. More photographs and how he utilized his old provisional from the initial case and he, and he fabricated that temporarily to serve as provisional now until the, uh, the roots are extracted and additional implants are placed. Okay, here's his new provisional that he had fabricated. And as you can see here, the provisional before an implant was placed in uh, site number 11. Okay, these are obviously uh, photographs he obtained from his surgeon. CBCT, it's all self-explanatory, CBCT of the implants in place. Uh, get second stage surgery, stating that bone, bone profiling was uh, required and he was ready to incorporate into his, his new provisional. Okay. He did a direct pickup in the now. As you can see here, how he's very clear and how he's using his materials to uh, Sculpt the emergence profile. He has the new modified provisional in place. What I like, what do I, what you can see here from this type of presentation: the quality of the photographs, the captions, and the descriptions. This is what we're looking for. Seating of the impression copings for the final restoration. Final screw retain layer porcelain mill zirconia framework on a tie base abutment. And here's the completed case. And once again, uh, the template with the descriptions, the background, the case presentation, uh, the evidence based research. The outcomes, discussions, and learning points. Once again, you'll be able to get this on on the academy's website. Okay, now documentation for your continuing education credits. See what this particular doctor did. He had he had every case list, every category listed. Course title, where the course was given, 
number of credits. So everything is organized and very clear for the MIDI when we're reviewing these things to look at it and evaluate it. It also makes our job easy. So just remember, you, all it takes is an ethic. You could do it if you really want to. But like I said, you have to be organized. You have to take good quality pictures and just follow the format. Here's the, uh, if you want to visit the, uh, the uh, Academy website, this is the uh, web address that you can get to get the information about the, uh, the certificate itself. But one little other caveat, I'm here to help you. Here is my email address. You can email me anytime you want, and I will get back to you to give you help on quality of photographs, the uh, description, how to, how to just go about how to do it if you have any questions. Feel free to get in touch with me at any time, and I promise I will get back to you. But this is something you could do. It takes a little bit of effort, but to make it worthwhile, it has to, it has to require a little bit of effort. But believe me, in the long run, you'll be proud of yourself, proud of your accomplishment, and you will get nice recognition from your peers and your restorative colleagues and surgical colleagues as well. And that's it. And any questions that you have, you can submit them, and uh, we'll be happy to address them. All right, and with that, we'll transition to our question and answer session. And as a reminder, the text chat is located on the right-hand side of your screen. To submit a question, type your question in the small text box at the bottom, and when finished, click the Send button. Please note that due to time constraints, our speaker may not respond to all questions submitted. If your question is not answered, please send your question to webinars at osseo.org. All right, so now we'll give just a few moments for any incoming questions to come through. Dr. President, it doesn't look like we're getting any incoming questions at this time. Um, so at this point, I'd like to pass it back over to you for any closing remarks you may have. Uh, like I said, if you, if you think of any questions, you can submit it to the AO or you have my uh, email address. That's, uh, I'll put it back up here. Let me get back. Let me get back here. It actually looks there. like we may have just received one question if you'd like to answer that. Sure, go ahead. All right, and the first question that we have is, do you have plans um, to have video uh, we can watch later? Um, actually, after uh, reading that, I can probably I answer that. This webinar is being recorded. Uh, well, I don't know what kind of video they're looking for. What, what, you know, obviously, like I said, if they want to go through the uh, the presentation again, it's going to be – on the AO website, they'll be able to access access it under their webinar section. So, I mean, what what kind of? I don't understand the question about videos. Okay, I do believe that question was just about the recording of this webinar today. So, um, you answered that oh, perfectly. Yeah, well, it will be available. Yeah, on on the website. Anything else? Perfect. Um, at this point, there are no other questions. Let me just make one closing remark. Absolutely. We want to make this, we want to make the process not a difficult one. The committee is here to help you. But it does take an effort. But anybody that's a member of the Academy has the ability to do this. And it's a worthwhile endeavor. That's all I can say. And like I said, if you have guys have any questions, please email them to me. I'll be more than happy to help you. If you want to, you can email me your phone number. I will be more than happy to give you a phone call and discuss any concerns that you may have. And uh, I just hope that you found this uh, 
short presentation, uh, informative and worthwhile of your time. And once again, on behalf of the Academy and myself, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. President. And on behalf of the Academy of Osseo Integration, I'd like to thank you for your t participation in today's event. This concludes today's program. Thank you and have a great day.